It's been 10 years since the release of the first unified shader graphics processors for PCs, the first being the GeForce 8800 GTX. Prior to its release, PC GPU architectures were based on dedicated vertex and pixel shader units that depending on the type of game, could end up taxing all of one type of shader while leaving some of the other kind idling. Before unified shader GPUs would make their debut, NVIDIA and ATI especially predicted developers were going to need multitudes more pixel shading power for more lifelike real-time scene rendering. In late 2005, ATI's X1000 series introduced two GPUs that massively decoupled this ratio, hitting an apex with the R580 GPU featuring 48 pixel shaders with 16 TMUs. With over 400 gigaflops of compute, the R580 would power many variants of Radeon X1900 graphics cards, ending the era of dedicated shaders with a final major hurrah. While I don't have a Radeon X1900 to show off to you today, I do have one of its little brothers, the ATI X1600 XT. This little puppy was marketed as the middle-end product in the 2005 Radeon X1000 series products, with the basic X1300 and performance-oriented Radeon X1800 rounding out the launch product stack. The X1900 would debut later in early 2006, but until then the X1800 would be ATI's PC gaming golden boy to fight Nvidia's GeForce 7800 GTX and to perhaps convince PC gamers not to jump ship to the Xbox 360, which released November of 2005. The X1600 XT with its RV530 GPU features 12 pixel shaders paired with 5 vertex shaders, but with a texture and render output processor array of just 4 units each. A quarter of that found on the X1800 and X1900 products, but the same as the X1300. The significance of the X1600 would still be the previously mentioned pixel shader to texture unit ratio, something that the X1300 and X1800 products in general don't reflect. You could allude that the X1600 was just a shader supercharged X1300, and the X1900 was a shader supercharged X1800. Despite being limited in texture and pixel output, the X1600 XT would at least prove useful for many now classic games released the year prior to its launch. Likewise, many early generation PC exclusive and multi-platform titles that didn't make full use of the Xbox 360's graphics capabilities could be enjoyed at medium settings and resolutions like 1024 by 768 Unfortunately, this transitionary period to the new consoles would quickly mark the X1600 XT to obsolescence when developers adopted the 360's graphical prowess as a template for new PC games. The X1600 XT would continue to meet system requirements, but its 512.44 configuration was directly lacking for the 720p HD gaming era. However, I would claim that its combination of capabilities, but small size, could have served a certain gaming company quite well had they chosen a more graphics-oriented position. I might discuss this in an upcoming video. Until then, let's take an extensive look at the X1600 XT and how it performs in a number of classic games from 2004 through 2007 in order of release. It sports a 590MHz RV530 GPU and 256MB of GDDR3 video memory on a 128-bit bus for 22GB per second of bandwidth. As stated earlier, the RV530 GPU has 12 pixel shaders, 5 vertex shaders, four texture mapping units, and four render output processors. I used a GPU-Z to validate these specs and to make sure I got what I paid for on eBay. I don't own an old computer with Windows XP and more era-appropriate hardware, so this X1600 XT is paired massively out of balance with a Core i5-4690K, 16GB of DDR3-1600 memory, while running Windows 7 64-bit. The driver is the final one AMD released that supported the X1600 series, released specifically for Windows Vista, and so far has not given me perceivable trouble here on Windows 7. I would expect a slight performance boost on Windows XP, but I still feel the results speak well about how the X1600 XT performs in general. Also, all the gameplay you see here is in 1280x720 resolution, unless otherwise noted to keep things kind of standardized. Moving on to the games, circa 2004 titles like Far Cry and Half-Life 2 
run quite well on the X1600 XT, skirting 60 FPS at times in both games, at 720p in just about max settings before we enable anti-aliasing. Honestly, I don't find the performance of either game surprising, but we must remember that Half-Life 2 has received some major upgrades since 2004, including increased shader asset quality and of course flashlight shadows, which can cut the frame rate in half. Likewise, Battlefield 2 is another game the X1600 XT absolutely flies on. It runs beautifully. When I first started playing Battlefield 2 on a laptop back in early 2006, I really wish I had had something even as modest as the X1600 in either that system or in a desktop. It would have made the experience so much better. Moving into late 2005 titles is when things get truly interesting for this graphics card, and by interesting I really mean bad. Developers had begun to move away from Xbox class performance and graphics thanks to high-end graphics cards and of course the looming monster that was the Xbox 360. Games would start to specifically target widescreen resolutions, support multi-core processors, all while continuously using more advanced graphical feature sets and techniques. So let's talk about our first Xbox 360 era title. Call of Duty 2 was about pushing the graphical envelope in a pivotal moment in how a PC-centric FPS translated to console. The Xbox 360 version knocked the graphical presentation out of the park with its 60 FPS target, achieving similar performance to that era's high-end video cards that could cost as much as the Xbox 360 itself and even more. Either game requires a more middle-of-the-road configuration when playing on the X1600 XT at 720p. Moving on, early 2006, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion was one of the Xbox 360's first killer apps, and like Call of Duty 2, would prove how capable the system was in the face of the PC. Oblivion has the distinction of being the first Xbox 360 game that required the hard drive for stable performance, and with one equipped, delivered a groundbreaking presentation that set the standard for open world RPGs. The X1600 XT requires a bit of tweaking at 720p, and a fair mix of medium settings provides playable performance, especially as you balance geometrical detail and effects. As a late 2006 title, Rainbow Six Vegas was one of the first multi-platform titles to really disregard the PC version to irrelevance, as the PC port is generally terrible, while the Xbox 360 version was much more consistent and polished. Graphics options are quite nil. Many options are only accessible on PC by directly engaging the game's config file. The geometrical complexity has no real options and R6 Vegas is built around the Xbox 360's capabilities. Because of such limitations, the X1600 XT struggles unless you use just about minimum settings at a very low resolution of 800x600 or 480p. The game simply isn't designed with the Radeon X1600 XT in mind. In contrast, 2007's Call of Duty 4 is a much more tweakable game. Unfortunately, scene-to-scene -scene performance is extremely variable. Despite being designed as a 60 frames per second title for the Xbox 360, the X1600 XT trudges through higher settings unless we make some graphical sacrifices. 720p can still be had with shadows and extra high textures, but enabling the rest of the effects like smoke softening and specular makes it unplayable in many areas of the campaign. It's quite plain to see that in two years, the X1600 XT went from being a sort of medium-ish range gaming option to an absolutely paltry product. I find it interesting that ATI came up with the product stack they did for the X1000 series, in comparison to the Xenos GPU they developed as well. The X1600 XT's shader and pipeline configuration was intensely bottlenecked in terms of texturing capability and in the render backend for games post-2005. Its main initial competition would end up being NVIDIA's GeForce 7600 products, which in comparison featured the traditional 1-to-1 pixel shader to texture unit Sheem and a 5-12-12-8 configuration. Simply put, the GeForce 7600 GT smacks the X1600 XT around, often thanks to those extra TMUs and render backends. In reality, cut down X1800 and X1650 products would have to fight the GeForce 7600 GT, with the X1900 series being the pièce de résistance in the entire lineup with its 48 pixel shaders. ATI's predicted need for shader power 
was reflected in their Xenos Unified Shader GPU with 48 unified shaders, 16 texture mapping units, and 8 render output processors. Having only 8 ROPs and 10 MB of EDRAM meant being practically limited to 720p, but it meant a very high processing density per rendered pixel. Anyone who went with an X1900 would at least enjoy greater performance and presentation than the Xbox 360 and pre-DirectX 10 titles. ATI's prediction of extreme increases in pixel shading in future games would prove correct, as the GeForce 7800 and 7900 series would just completely fail to perform anywhere near as well as the X1900 in later years. The 360's Xenos Unified Shader GPU was a direct bridge between ATI's last dedicated shader equipped GPUs and their PC Unified Shader descendants. The Unified Shaders in Xenos are in fact close cousins of the X1000 series pixel shaders, just modified to perform vertex and geometry shading. This design would be further modified into the Radeon X2000 series and continuously improved up through the Radeon HD6000 series of graphics processors, adding full DirectX 10 and DirectX 11 functionality along the way. This X1600 XT released during a very nostalgic time for me, as I had just became an adult and was making my first real forays into PC gaming. I never had one or any of its family products until now, but I wish I did being stuck on laptops with weak dedicated graphics at that time. This little footnote in GPU history represents the end of one era and the beginning of another, and that to me makes it very much worth appreciating. My name is Blitz, and thank you for joining me on this inaugural episode of Hardware Chronicles. I hope to see you next time.